This is like the, uh, the elite subset, so welcome. Um, some of your colleagues will be filtering back in, some of your less fortunate colleagues. Uh, is anybody here gonna leave to go to the job fair? It's fine, that was just a joke. Not a good one. Um, <laughs> Uh, although I'm curious, is that true? Are some of you not at the job fair because you're already lined up? Oh, okay. Some of us didn't know there was a job fair. Okay. What kind of uh, what kind of companies are here this year? <laughs> I guess I'm asking the wrong people. Okay. Well, we will maybe I'll re-ask that later. Um, and something that I wanted to do today that is still doable, of course, is to get you into groups. Although I think that because of the, not everybody's here, I'm not gonna try to make this be a introduction to your group groups. This'll just be some groups. These won't be the groups. Um, Cause there's some activities to do today. Cause uh, I don't think you want me to talk at you the whole time like I did last time. Though clearly I am prepared to do that. So, uh, so speaking of, uh, I guess maybe before getting into uh, reading for this time, how about about last time? Are there any questions, objections, fundamental concerns that we should talk about before we talk about more of what I revealed to you as the plan for what we do in here? Those who had the worst problems with it disenrolled, so that's good. Um, there's about 60 of us now. There were 70 of us last time that we met. Okay. Well, then let's dig into the stuff for today. It's a very simple plan. Uh, first up here, I know some things about Richard Saul Werman that I would love to share with you. My sense of information architecture is shaped entirely by my understanding of him and his work, so I will share that with you. I have brought some... Uh, just a, a, uh, just, a, just a little bit of my library of things that Mr. Werman made. Uh, all of you have an invitation to come to my office in Grand Rapids where there are racks and racks of uh, printed things that he made that I've collected over the years. He did more than 80 or 90, the count is, is pretty fuzzy books. And I have most of them in my office. So if anything that you learn about him uh, turns you on and you wanna see more of his stuff, our libraries have a lot of it, but uh, um, not all of it, so, uh, okay. So then uh, part two, we'll take a break, uh, then we'll come back. I told Richard that uh, he should click on a link at two o'clock. We'll see if that results in him joining us uh, via the screen. And uh, any of you, if you formulated a question, if you become curious about something, um, either that you read about in Molly's book or any of the things that I say in the first part of class, I get to talk to him a lot and I'm perfectly happy to just have a public conversation with him for your benefit, um, which really means for my benefit. So uh, here's a chance to take a crack at somebody who invented this field. If you have a question, that would be great. If not, I have some questions. So that will be the middle part. And then the last part, uh, last week I introduced a tool to you that I said helps us understand any medium that anything that we do that we use as a tool or to extend ourselves based on the work of Marshall McLuhan. Uh, we will break up into groups and then you'll have the opportunity to do one or both of a little activity that I've prepared. Uh, one of them would be doing that tetrad analysis on some medium together and then uh, sharing that with the class to remind us of how those work. And then the other thing that we can do is I brought a newspaper from 1976, and uh, we could apply one of Richard Saul Werman's key teachings about latch, about the organization of information, creating new information, to an analysis of any newspaper article. So if you all want to use something uh, from the news on your screens, that's fine too. But we'll have a chance to apply both McLuhan and Werman if we like. Does that make sense? Okay, well, uh, how about starting with any uh, questions or observations that you got from, from the reading? First question, has anybody had difficulty if you wanted to acquire this book? Are there uh, supply problems with obtaining a copy? Does anybody run into those? Okay, good. So those of you who have uh, read it, which some of us may not have, 
any questions or observations about uh, anything in here? I mean, we're talking about Richard Saul Worman today, so we could start with that. But it starts out with Christopher Alexander, who's somebody that we will talk about later in the term. And uh, it touches on the thing that we are going to be working on, which is the idea of artificially intelligent systems and what are the structures of information that are good to use with those. So uh, that's my pitch for the thing you've already had been made to do. So uh, it's okay if uh, somebody goes first. Does anybody think it was a uh, boring show of hands as a text to read? Somewhat boring, okay. Uh, how about academical? Like, was it too academic-y? I mean, I realize we're in the academy and we're in the classroom and we're in graduate school, but uh, did it feel like, so that doesn't seem like that was a problem. A little bit boring though. Who has a prior knowledge of any of the four architects uh, that this book talks about? Anybody bump into Nicholas Negroponte or Cedric Price in your other coursework? Oh, huh, okay. So maybe that's good. Maybe uh, these are some new, new connections for you to consider. Uh, did you like the parts about me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> surface and circular relationship between physical architecture and information architecture and like the architecture computer systems and, and how to put that all together and then how to insert myself and my own work into that. And I uh, spent a lot of time not entirely knowing how or why the process was. Thank you. Uh, let me take a swing at restating what you asked. Uh, so there is this relationship that is the predicate of the whole book, which is that there is something going on with physical architects and architecture and the architecture of computer systems and information. And these have been put into a swirl of some sort throughout as we read. And you didn't know where you were supposed to be standing relative to what was going on with that, like, here's some information about these four architects and, and how physical space was sometimes involved, sometimes not involved. And, and how to care about that? Yeah, not being an architect, not having any prior experience in either physical or information architecture. Yeah. And then there's also the question of what do I do? Thank you, yes. I, uh, and it, it lines with something that I, that I read very recently and I didn't read soon enough to share with any of you, but um, I think it might actually be how you came to that realization, which is when you have a big piece of reading and you don't have your own interest in it yet, uh, read for argument, maybe not for all of the words or the full sweep of what somebody who is really excited about a subject wants to tell you everything about it, but reading for argument. So it sounds like you didn't know what the argument was about. <laughs> right. Yep. So beyond history, what was the argument and how, how are you supposed to do something with it? Yeah, I, I guess I was left feeling like I didn't have enough kind of information to fully process the argument. I think the argument is basically something to do with the relationship between physical and physical. Mm -hmm. And that one influences the other, not necessarily in a unidirectional way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's fair. Uh, did anybody find an argument that goes beyond? And what is your name, please? Hillary. Hillary, thank you. Did anybody see, feel an argument in there that goes beyond what Hillary observed? Something going on with architects and architecture and information architecture. Uh, but how we're supposed to internalize that or use it, not clear. 
Yeah. No, I think that's good. And I hope that through many Mondays, we will find a way to, uh, to tap that value because one of the, I think one of the things that those of us who are already enthusiastically, you know, following these people's ideas and have dug into them a lot is the idea that maybe that's what's missing. Uh, if like me, you have a bad attitude about all of, or most of the things that happen on these screens and all of this stuff that we're supposed to do in screen land and why is it so bad? Uh, I don't know this for a fact, I know Molly just a little bit, but I think what propels some of us into this investigation of the relationship between the architecture of the built environment and information architecture is that we know for a fact that there are places that are good for us and we have experiences with them all the time and we suspect maybe that we could make these do that too. Um, and so how does this book uh, get you, certainly doesn't give you any how for how you might do that, but tracing through the development of some of these fields that we're involved in, uh, how these things have begun to relate, I think that's her minimally viable product in this book. Any other takeaways or uh, wished for and didn't get takeaways from these 200 and some pages plus endnotes? Yes. Um, I think one thing when I was particularly related to uh, like Richard Solomon and like the I mean, I think this would apply to other people too. He seems like very interested in his sort of take on design and information architecture was like how people learn and how he learns and like the information changes people's relationship to information. But I mean, I was curious, like, I feel like. Like, okay, you're following me, it's like a follow up interesting, was interesting to me, and like that's what guides him. But I feel like I was like wanting, I'm like, okay, so you, you want to change this, and it seems to be there's this thing beyond yourself. You don't want to just change your relationship or sort of how you are, right? But I, I didn't quite understand, or I feel like I couldn't find like how he sort of assesses that what he's doing or like experimenting or trying actually changes other people's relationships to the information or how they are. Like I couldn't grasp how he sort of understood that or assessed that beyond like his own personal interest. I'll take a stab at restating that, see if I got it. Um, <laughs> in the podcast, especially, and who didn't have to, but I'm curious, did anybody listen to that uh, conversation with Debbie Millman and Richard Sawerman? Yeah, so in this podcast, uh, Millman had a hard time taking at face value, and it sounds like you may also, the idea that the learnings, we don't have a learning system. We have an education system that is manifestly broken in every possible way. It's exactly what you wouldn't do. That's what we have. And as somebody who says that learning is remembering what you are interested in, and unless you find your personal way of understanding something, it's not going to work for you, then how can you ask for some other system that works for society with this sort of asshole attitude of, uh, I just do this for myself, and you should just do what you're interested in, and all this is wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that is part of uh, why that was such a challenging conversation for both people who tried to have it, is, uh, <laughs> uh, delightfully combative, yeah, I think that's a fair, uh, maybe generous way of describing it. Did anybody think that that, because uh, clearly there were some things that they didn't connect on. Um, did anybody think that, that it was a rhetorically unfair uh, that, that they treated each other without the respect that was uh, that uh, good people in good faith having a real conversation? Did anybody feel like that was violated? Yeah, I, so I've been listening to uh, Designing Matters for a while, and I've heard a lot of interviews that Debbie Williams conducted, and she talked about the fact that she was one that 
you could argue didn't go so well, but so I feel like Debbie has like a structure of like she has a genre of what she thinks of her podcast she's been doing for like know, over a decade. And like Mormon just seemed like not to like have any regard for that and not to care. Like that seemed that part seemed dismissive to me and a little bit uncouth. Okay. In the sense that like you agreed to do this at least try to play by some of the rules. Um, but he had some valid points about why was she talking about his time being destitute. Some people might find that interesting and like the arc of the narrative arc of someone overcoming the challenge might be interesting to the podcast listener, but he didn't care to talk about that and was very almost defensive about difficult periods in his life. Um, so I'm interested to know like how you as a biographer are approaching that like how are you writing about the narrative arc of his life, but through a lens that satisfies them or just satisfies you? Well, wow, there's a lot to respond to there. Um, he seems like he, he wants to define it in his own terms. And like, if someone else tries to say it, it's not, it's not satisfying. Yes. Uh, I think the mode that would have helped things, although I'm really grateful to Millman for toughing it out. And it actually demonstrates one of his core teachings, which is that uh, you need discomfort. That com He says it, right? Comfort is not your friend. That there's something in uh, discomfort that helps us. And that if we're optimizing, so he's not optimizing to be happy. Um, he's also not optimizing for pleasant interpersonal exchange, which breaks the rules, right? We have a social covenant um, and he breaks that. Uh, but what he's optimizing for is having an interesting exchange. Um, and he says that he is interested, he doesn't care about the discomfort. And in some ways, I think he said some things to and with her that he doesn't always say because she created an environment that had enough discomfort in it where it, it was generative discomfort. Um, but I'm, I am curious as a biographer to know how people, cause I'm, I love him. Um, I have a personal, a deep personal affection for him. Uh, and I'm not making any, uh, I'm not going to pretend to tell an objective truth about this person. Um, but I, I am really interested to know, if people think that he's being dishonorable in these exchanges, because from my point of view, and again, I'm tainted by affection. I was amazed that he didn't seem to pull the, but I'm a famous designer or to shut, to stop speech and to use uh, a particularly uh, patriarchal mode with her. I didn't see that at all. But one thing that a lot of people can't get past uh, she has maybe a verbal tick when she says, really? That wasn't, she wasn't, right? Like, I don't know that she meant to insult him and call him a liar, but he just needs to somehow in the moment catch that and, and flag it and say, when I hear that, I'm not saying that you, you're calling me a liar, but when you say that, it disrupts our conversation because why are we questioning whether or not I'm being truthful? Of course I'm being truthful. So, um, yes. I feel like half of his thing is calling into question things that we don't think about, right? And so he was calling, he, her, her maybe automatic way of speaking when she said, really? She may have never thought what that means That's by right. saying it. And so he was questioning her. And because it was her thing, I think she um, maybe felt attacked. It was rude. It was rude, but that's kind of like if you invite <laughs> someone who invented a wheel onto your podcast and expect no kind of um, none of that kind of thinking, you're going to be surprised, right? Like, that's what he does. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah, um, I have a comment. I have studied linguistics, and the um, conversation from a linguistic perspective was actually very interesting because there was an advantage of the social contract, the social contract of, of how speech is going to be, and that you have to assume when you're talking to people in general that they're cooperating with you, that they um like the metaphor that we like using linguistics for speech is that 
somebody has something that's assembled out of a bunch of pieces and to send it to somebody else's idea, they have to disassemble it, send it over one by one, and send the blueprint, and the person who receives it has to reassemble the idea. And I think that he was kind of willfully refusing to use the blueprint. <laughs> like, there was definitely, like, he knew what she was intending to say, and he was refusing to accept that. Um, and I'm not sure what to make of that. Part of me feels like he was doing that in order to maintain control of the conversation and not let her have control of the conversation. Um, and I do think that, I don't think dishonorable would be the word that I would use because I don't think it's necessarily dishonorable, but I do think some of his answers were disingenuous. Interesting. Thank you for making that distinction. Yes. Um, I really agree. I think it was, interesting from a uh, linguistic point of view and what i got out of it i listened to it twice um because i didn't have this idea the first time until about until it was pretty much over and then i listened to it again to see if there was a pattern there but i got the feeling that she was doing the who are you interview and that was something that was almost offensively um, interesting to him and he wanted to talk about what he wanted to do because you can either like say, who do I want to be in this world? Or what do I want to do in this world? And they're very different questions. That's fascinating. So a irreconcilable set of postures toward what that conversation was going to do. And neither of them relented. And the social contract is when it's somebody else's show, you relent. Um, and he didn't. But he like... The second time I listened to it, he said, that's not interesting to me. I want to talk about what I want to do next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I, it bothered me um, how he kept saying he was lazy and stupid, you know? And <laughs> that's, the disingen that's the disingenuous I he was part. Yeah. <laughs> I have no skills. That? But that part that I have no skills, I can't type. Yeah, and like, yeah. was was it just to elicit a response, or or is that actually something he thinks? And if that's true, I just it makes me think about this concept of really only pursuing what you're solely interested in, because I think it can have this effect of siloing you off from other people. And while I agree that there's a lot of issues with the education system and what in this top-down approach of what we're instructed. And what we're expected to learn. Um, the, the woman conducting the interview, I think, got at this idea that there are certain things we all need to know and all need to learn to be a cohesive society. And this kind of uh, roughness between them, I think, can, can fall back to, to the idea that he was siloed off, I think, a little bit from her. Um, and so I thought that, yeah, that was interesting. That, and I, I, I just, I didn't understand how, if he's dumb, or lazy, like who's that in comparison to the general public, <laughs> to people in this field? I mean, maybe to the problem solving designer that Millman expected him to be in comparison to that. Yeah, I think it's important for him to think about himself as not relying on a uh, facility, some uh, amazing skill. And I do think it's somewhat disingenuous for somebody who has amazing amounts of skill to emphasize, to need people to somehow acknowledge or accept a context around you of non-expertise. But it's very important to him. And I think a biographical examination of how he's made choices and lived his life, uh, his success has been based so much on the lack of expertise that he wants it to be understood that way. One, one way I interpreted the comment is that him thinking of himself as not smart was that he seems to me to be like a notorious polymath. He's a generalist. He's, you know, he's, he's looked deeply into many fields. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but some people use the phrase like, Jack S of all trades, master of none. And I think that's that's how I was hearing him say that he's not smart, just in the sense that he's not a specialist in one field. Then you could argue 
it has rebounded a new field. Yeah. And he'll just as easily call himself a Johnny One Note. Um, he's happy with that self-given, uh, you know, little label around the neck. Uh, Johnny One Note, like he, like you've got a horn and there's one note, and you just do that. Um, but yeah. Well, why don't uh, I'm curious to know more, and I'm curious. Uh, I hope some of you will take the opportunity to come up here and look at him on the screen and, and ask him some stuff. Uh, but in the four or how many are there on the 22 minutes that we have before the break uh, before we'll look for him, see if this technology works. Um, I can just tell you some things about what I've uh, tried to distill out of this guy's work and uh, see what you think. Uh, I love what Molly said about his work and uh, for any of you who like, I, my company recreated this uh, swimming poster that he made for a book about the 1976 Olympics. And we have plenty of them, uh, so you're welcome to, to take one home if you like. Uh, claiming space through the structuring of information, uh, finding the form in information, that there is a way that you can put information in space. And what this teaches in a really beguilingly simple and effective way the link you can probably see it from there the length of the ribbon is the relative lengths of the races uh pink and blue or, or uh yellow and no women and men are on, on each one yeah so women and men are are in different categories in these sports as they are played and then you can see relative to each other through comparison through the dumbest possible uh put this next to that and see what's different you can learn about all these different swimming events and how uh, attainment works in these different events. And uh, that that's a fundamentally spatial thing. I think if there's one takeaway, and, and it sounds like Molly's book didn't really get us there, but for me, I think that's the critical difference between Richard Saul Werman's sense of information architecture, why I think it's so, so valuable to us today as the spatial dimension in our work uh, is going to just drop on us like a ton of lead, uh, that information in space, that we can claim that as a discipline and that we can change what it means. Uh, we can even offload the work of meaning in the world through how we situate things in space. We can encode information in space. It's completely brilliant. And a lot of folks would look at this as, oh, that's uh, maybe three quarters of the way to what a Milton Glaser level graphic designer would do. Uh, Werman's work has been often thin sliced. Uh, Peter and Lou, people like us, right, trained as information scientists, when they saw Werman's Information Architects book in 1998, they didn't see anything in there that spoke to them. And so uh, Molly's rendition of this history not leaping out at us as something that speaks to us uh, concerns me a little bit uh, because I think this is unbelievably important to us. And it's something I didn't get through library and information science. I did not, uh, maybe it was, I wasn't listening for it, but being given permission to say that space is the dimension where our work comes to life, where it makes or breaks is us putting information in spatial relations and what those do. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm so crazy about this man and his work. Uh, the other reason that I'm so fond of him is because he talks about the truth all the time. And nobody, uh, has anybody seen the uh, film, The Great Short? Couple of us. There's a R-rated quote from that film. Uh, the truth is like poetry and people fucking hate poetry. The Big Short? The Big Short, sorry, yeah, yeah. What did I say, The Great Short? It wasn't great, it was big though. Um, it wasn't great for me, it wasn't great for many of us, but. Uh, and this idea, and, and I think this is something that Peter and Lou felt and why that first Information Architects coffee table book that Molly describes in the chapter on women, um, Peter and Lou saw this work as design and that that isn't something that gets you at the truth. And because they didn't, uh, things were moving pretty fast. I don't blame them for not digging into the uh, Wormanalia that existed, but they didn't see this possible way to align with what Werman was always talking about, which is that designers by and large don't get it. 
that design by and large is about simplification and that what information architects do, which is amazing, is make the complex clear. We're not simplifying anything, we're not taking anything away. The problem space is not reduced prior to us making it pretty. We don't hit anything with a pretty stick. We make the complex clear through the rigor and the relationships of the elements. And my God, it just always turns out beautiful if the relationships are right. And so this willingness to say, and to uh, like a generalization against designers, uh, they're trying to solve a problem. They're trying to solve a problem. And what I wanna talk about is the truth. I think that's another reason why Millman and Werman did not connect, is my sense is Millman's sense of what design does is it solves problems. And what Richard's sense of what information architecture does is tell the truth. And that is such a hard thing to talk about and such a uh, difficult uh, work for those of us that want to make those two things talk to each other. But I do want very much for those things to, to touch and to talk to each other. Uh, I have the University of Michigan to thank for the ability to meet Richard uh, in 2009, the Penny Stamp series, which is such a remarkable thing for uh, Ann Arbor. If you've not checked some of these out, uh, I would just attend on the basis of really great curation, even if you don't know the name. Uh, but I just saw a flyer. I didn't, uh, nobody notified me, um, which uh, made me feel uh, small and unimportant in the world of Worman lovers. But nevertheless, uh, here was this poster. Worman was giving a talk at the Michigan Theater as part of the Penny Stamps thing. And our dearly departed, I mean, he's not dead, but he's just not here, uh, Dean Jeff Mackey Mason, uh, I sent him an email and said, I'll never ask you for anything again, but if there's some dinner or something, can I please get into it? Because Richard Saul Worman invented my field and I really want to talk to Richard Saul Worman. And there was a dinner after this talk that he gave and uh, Mackie Mason sent an email and I got an invite and uh, I knew that he's left-handed, so I chose where to sit at dinner. I completely dominated the conversation. The people from the art school who paid the money to bring him to town, the first class travel expenses that he demands, uh, they didn't get to say shit. Uh, <laughs> because Richard Saul Worman is in my town and I got him right next to me. Um, and uh, in 2009, after he gave his presentation, he then remarked, uh, I hate doing Q and A's because all you get is speeches and bad questions. But there was time left, so he said, but okay, so if anybody wants to do a speech or a bad question, so I'm in the front row. And, uh, and had that not all took place, I don't think I would be, uh, uh, it's hard to, hard to know how much progress I would have made in trying to figure out this guy's work without the ability to meet him and talk to him. So um, thank you, University of Michigan. Thank you, Jeff Mackey Mason. Uh, thank you, Penny Stamps Speaker Series. And uh, so I've known him for a while and my relationship with him has transformed from sycophant to uh, disciple to, uh, it, it's gone through any number of phases. This is me at his house a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm trying to get a documentary film feature length about him made in the world and that other people do too. Um, but I think he has a lot to offer uh, people like us. And uh, it's the same if you look at any of his work. So I have some really lovely examples of his work here that you guys can look at. Um, I was amazed when I started to do the work, uh, first to understand this for information architects, but then additionally as a biographer. So when I met him in 2009, he was working on this project called 1920-21. Super memorable title, uh, has to do with maps and geography. This is gonna be about 19 cities with 20 million or more people in the 21st century. Conferences, computer things, like all sorts of ways to dig into his curiosity about cities at this scale and how we need to figure out how to make them be good. And the way of going about this being no different than the way he went about his high school yearbook. There he is up in the corner there. Uh, this was the only high school yearbook in 1953 that didn't have a plush, squishy cover. And probably the only one that never used any capital letters. Um, he somehow designed this in such a way that uh, it only used lowercase type and uh, won awards in 1953. Uh, and what he's doing now, a project called Isle, 
um, which is five uh, things, maybe they're films, maybe they're books, he's not sure yet, about these topics that are uh, hard to know what to do about in the world and his sense of understanding preceding action and maps being the mechanism to understanding. It's a project about cartography and these subjects and that's about all he knows at this point. And if we like, we could ask him, uh, if we run out of questions, I'm gonna ask him to talk about what he's doing with this. But the way that he goes about this, that's the Johnny One Note. He has a way of doing and I feel like I understand the way of doing. And so um, these are five things that he does. Um, I think these are things that you can do as an information architect, um, all of them, and that you would prosper uh, by considering these as ways of working and ways of thinking. So the first one uh, from that reading Hats, that special issue of Design Quarterly, uh, the creative organization of information creates new information. I have a friend, uh, Dorian Taylor, up in uh, Vancouver, who uh, really turned me on to the idea of this as an encoding and decoding of information in the environment. Sort of like a, an analog computer externalized into printed material and meat space, that how you organize this stuff puts more information into the environment somehow or has the sense of how is this supposed to be used? What would be the best way to understand this? That through these acts of architecting the information, by changing the situatedness of, for example, the male and female, uh, if you had a friend who made stuffed animals like Richard does, and if you got your friend to make male and female stuffed animals of all of the AKC recognized breeds of dog, and you line them up in different ways, you never take the dogs away, what's possible to know about dogs um, and how humans interact with them can be changed on the function of, uh, as a function of how you arrange them. Um, and to think about that with everything in this space, the way that it is situated includes information. The size of that clock tells us something about how important timekeeping is in the environment here. And why am I the one who gets to look at it, but you all are relieved from the torture of watching it go so slow as I drone on and on. Uh, that this is a marvelous capability that we have to put information in the environment. It can be an environment like this on a page. It can be a physical environment. That's how Richard was trained as an architect. But that's what we're doing, situating information in space, encoding meaning in the process. And we can make it mean what we want it to mean more and better by considering the different ways of situating the elements in space. Uh, that's what he does. And in the uh, hats reading that you all had uh, at this time, I think this was uh, at about the time of the publication of Information Anxiety, uh, thinking that there are just five and, and not in a kind of an asshole way of these are the only five, but in a really dumb way of saying, I think these are the five ways to organize information and the way that you can play around with uh, what can be understood. What is the truth about the material that I'm working with through the playing with permutations of situatedness in space along a couple of different lines and initially alphabet, time, location, continuum, category. Uh, eventually it gets morphed into something even stickier that you can remember, latch. We'll talk about that a little later. I had an experience with this uh, that made me feel old. Um, I was looking at a record store and I was looking for a particular record and I felt good because I recognized all the things, but the record that I was looking for was not present. What I didn't realize is that they had created a special section just for old people like me. <laughs> and so this is where the stuff that I really wanted to look at or what I was looking for, it was in the from 2001 forward. What a weird uh, bifurcation of the world of pop music. I don't know what happened in 2001. I don't know if that's Kurt Cobain or what that is. Um, but anyway, that, the, that there's a strategy here, right? That the record store thinks it's gonna sell more records by situating these things in space. Uh, last week, I showed you a picture of a bookstore 
I covered all the books with uh, craft paper, and then somebody wrote all in the same handwriting descriptions of them. So there's something akin to that with the situatedness of the elements in space and what's possible to mean probably they can sell more records if they start considering these different ways of organizing. This happens to be the record store in Athens, Georgia, where Pete Buck met Michael Stipe. Uh, Buck was working there and on the basis of the record Stipe bought, knew that they could be in a band together. It's beautiful. Something you didn't need to know. Uh, so this is, this is a picture of uh, that dog's thought experiment from information anxiety. If you organize them by country of origin, uh, one really interesting thing to look at is the popular breeds of dogs cross-listed with the average amount of square footage in the place that you're looking at and how the McMansionization of suburbia in the middle and upper classes of the United States track with the increasing size or decreasing size of dogs. But the situatedness of this information would govern what you can know, what you, what's possible to understand. Uh, the next thing that he does, the fancy word for it, I think is app perception, a perception. Um, this is the uh, elsewhere known or some places known as Werman's first law, which is you only understand something relative to something you already understand. And the huge breakthrough that he came to around this as a teacher in North Carolina, as a 26 year old in 1963. Uh, I have three copies of this. There were 1500 of them made. Um, after we talk with him, I will encourage you all to play with them. Uh, what they do is uh, he couldn't find, whether it's because he's in Raleigh, Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina in 1963, or it didn't exist, or the library system was not good. He wanted to do comparison of cities and towns that were architecturally significant uh, for his students in first year architecture and he couldn't find maps of these cities all drawn at the same scale. And so rather than waiting for uh, interlibrary loan to deliver that someday, he initiated a project with his students to make models of 50 cities and towns all at the same scale, photograph them all the same way, and then published them in the school's uh, this uh, slip case and uh, books, uh, which are lined up up here, was the school uh, art publication format anyhow. And so he came up with this amazing way to understand any of these cities. He said a little pejoratively that the students in North Carolina, many of them sort of took it as a badge of honor. They'd never been above the Mason Dixon line. And he thought that that was uh, intellectually uh, not sweet. Uh, he said, he talked about Helsinki and Al Alvo, Al who's that guy? Al Alto? Yes, that guy. And the students didn't know what a Helsinki was. And so had them make models all to the same scale. And the ability to, in loose leaf fashion, compare any two cities and literally put them next to each other. So here's one city, here's a map of it. Here's another city, this is Versailles. So this is the Palace of Versailles compared to, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, Aguas Mortes in France, founded in 1246 by Louis IX as an embarkment point for the Crusades. So how big is this relative to this? Well, you, you know, you can just take, if you know one of these 50 cities or towns, you can put it next to any of the other ones and you understand. Uh, I believe this to be one of the finest works of information architecture ever. And so here's the map. You can't see it from where you're sitting. Uh, but all these little 50 dots all over the world. Find one that you've been to. Now you can understand 49 more things. Uh, this has only become possible with digital cartography in the last 10 years, let's say. And it's because of Richard Werman's relationship with Esri, the mapping company, that they have now started to do this, which is cartographic measurement of cities and towns all at the same scale. Uh, he was able to do it with kindergarten clay with college students. And it's amazing and I can't wait for you to play with it. Uh, and this is some of that uh, dumb speak that we heard earlier. Um, this is from an interview uh, that I did with him um, talking about this thing that he made with 
students in 1963 as a 26-year-old, it just got to be known. It got very famous. And I said, what the fuck is this? I thought this must have been done a hundred times before, and the rel revelatory thing was that nobody had ever done it. And I said, holy moly, you know, I backed into dog poop in some terrific way. Here's my life laid ahead of me. I could just do this. If this hasn't been done, there's a lot of things that haven't been done comparatively, and I could just do this. And it seemed that way for the first few things. After he did this, that's all he did. And then I didn't, and now I'm doing it again um, at the time. This is a couple of years ago when he said this to me. Um, but this idea that this wasn't some brilliant attainment of being super smart, it was uh, a naive thing of wanting to use the simplest form of analysis available to us, which is visual comparison side by side of two things. And the uh, genius of equalizing the scale in the process of doing that, a magnificent work of information architecture. <laughs> by my eye. Uh, the next thing that he did was a huge atlas. I, uh, I didn't take it this time. Sometimes I lug far more books along. I was feeling lazy today. Um, a giant comparative atlas before computers projecting census data onto urban maps, all at the same scale again, so that you could understand uh, urban phenomenon comparatively. Uh, next thing. This is uh, less of a uh, technique, like you only understand something relative to something you understand. Uh, this is more of sort of an MO, which is terror and confidence. Uh, the combination of doing something that is beyond your ability or boasting about the intent to do something before you have the means to do it or permission to get away with it. Uh, this has been a hugely powerful uh, way of operating in the world for Mr. Worman. He lied and said that he knew how to do plane table surveying so that he could get onto the group of people from the University of Philadelphia, that's not a thing, from Penn, where he went, to Tikal in Guatemala, to the first group of people from the United States to map, to map ruins in Tikal. Uh, when they got there, he then owned up to the fact that he didn't know how to do the thing that they flew him down there to do. Um, there was not another plane or a boat for a couple of months, and they just had to let him do it. So they had to teach him how to do it. He wanted to do it, and uh, sometimes he lies in order to do what he wants. Uh, he said, the gift I have is that nothing is easy, and that difficulty excites me. Another way that he applies this uh, combination of terror of not having permission or knowing if you can pull it off, and then confidence to just do it anyway has to do with making pronouncements about projects that he does not yet have the means to pull off. Uh, one of them uh, was gonna be amazing, which was uh, called 555. He was gonna have five conferences in five different parts of the world with five people making predictions about five years into the future about what we need to be worried about. And then the best one from each of those would come together, uh, from the first four would come together, and then the fifth one would be him and those four people talking about uh, what we need to worry about. It was going to be called Finding the Future First was one of the taglines. Uh, this was a speculative piece of print. Collateral to support it never happened. But he needs the threat of humiliation from not doing something in order to progress forward to do things. And uh, it works for him at least. Uh, two more quickly before we see if he's in internet land waiting for us, uh, or he may have joined us already. I have to look for him on the conference. Uh, what before how? Uh, there was a little snippet in the Hats, book, Hats booklet, if you read it, that talks about this. Uh, the pervasiveness of designers thinking about how they're going to do something prior to being rigorous with what they are going to do. A really fun example of this from his own life is an atlas before there were uh, Google Maps and things, uh, if you wanted to drive somewhere, you would have a random McNally road atlas that organized always the country alphabetically. And you can't drive from Alabama to Alaska to Arizona to Arkansas, but the adjacency of the alphabetical order is what drove every atlas that you could commonly get at a gas station prior to Werman in 1990 getting a car having to drive places, which he hadn't had to do for a long time, and being unsatisfied with an alphabetically oriented atlas. 
So he found a way to design his own. Uh, and I think this is a great example of what do you want uh, before you decide how to do it or accept a modality for how it's always been done. Uh, this is a picture of a cookbook that he designed with Martha Stewart that was never made. Um, there was something, I'm going to ask him about this, something about cooking that he thought that you could get at uh, that wasn't afforded by the modality of cookbooks that he was familiar with. Uh, so talking with Martha Stewart about this what and the how that they came up with was a pyramidal shape. We can ask him about that. Um, yeah, okay, that's enough. So let's see if Richard is around. Feel free to take a bio break while we try to connect the internet hoses here. Aha. I think you should call it a kid. Richard, meeting. hello. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> oh, no. You can't hear me. Well, I see something. Oh, our attendees can hear Richard, so let's... Well, I can hear you. Oh, hooray, hello. I can hear you now, too. But I can't see me, and you're little, but I can make you big, but I'd like you to see me. I'd like to see what I look like. Well, I want to see you, too. I, I presumed that we could have you share your video camera. Well, I should be able to. Share screen. I'll push buttons. And let me see if I can get you hooked up to our AV. Is she still there? Can she come in and help me? He's on. We're talking, but I can't see me. You can't see me. Okay. I got, I pushed there. Share screen, I got. Can we hear you now? No, nope, oh, I can't can hear you now. Me? I can hear him. He sometimes can hear me. Okay. You just... Yes. There should be a little picture of me here. <laughs> this isn't the classic Skype. It is. It's just a different way of it not working. So it's the host has stopped it. Video. Oh, I see me now, finally. There you are. But now I don't see you. <laughs> I'm the guy that has white hair and stripes. 